and many different times in terms of different parts of the world, wherever you belong to. Welcome. Welcome to our course, One World, One Health, One Medicine. Now, this is a course that has spanned the year 2020-2017 as part of the 40th anniversary celebrations here at St. St. University. We trust that you have joined the course previously, but if not, if this is your first time, welcome. And it's great to have you on board with us. My name is Satish Badesi, and I will be presenting this seminar entitled Airs, Waters and Places in Modern Day Perspective. But before I actually begin my seminar, I would just like to briefly reflect and contemplate on the year that was 2017 in terms of this course itself. We began the course in January of this year with our Chancellor, Dr. Charles Modica, who spoke about his experiences in global medical education, especially using the case study, study of St. George's University. And throughout each month, we had faculty to alumni to students that shared with us different aspects of global health with entailed humans, animals, and or the environment itself. What we hopefully tried to present to you in this course was, was, was the various facets that we have to offer here at St. George's University in terms of health from a medical perspective, understanding health from a social perspective, an environmental perspective, engaging the discussions on discussions on discussions on discussions on health, whether it's physical, mental, social well-being, as defined by the World Health Organization. And hopefully we can appreciate that, that, that each and every one of us have a role to play as it relates to health and well-being. And that is in fact the premise of the course One World, World One Health and One Medicine. When we think about our global challenges today, whether we live in a small island community or a large metropolis, at times we are at risk for the very same diseases, whether it's infectious or whether it's non-communicable chronic diseases because of the global nature of the world in which we live in today. And, that, and, that, and, that, and that's why we think about one world. When we think about one health, we need to appreciate more that health is more than just symptoms of an individual person or an animal. Those symptoms may be a reflection of a deeper story, a broader context, context, context. maybe it's the environment they belong to, maybe it's their practices, behavior, maybe there are certain risk factors that predispose one to adverse health outcomes. So One Health seeks to engage, engage, engage the issue of health beyond the individual symptoms and more towards the, the context and the, the broad definition of health in terms of all the various influences that impacts health. And then we think about one medicine. One medicine because humans and their health is inextricably linked between that of animals and the envir envir environment. Through this course, we saw examples, whether it's parasitic diseases, whether it's viral diseases, vector-borne diseases, many, many conditions that cross species. And that's why the one medicine approach encourages for the inextricable link of human health with that of animals and the environment. So I trust that the course would have engaged different aspects of health and we will culminate this course with today's seminar on airs, waters and places. Now, I chose to present the topic specifically because airs, waters, and places as a thematic representation was made popular by Hippocrates. Hippocrates considered the father far of modern medicine in many regards. And at that time, 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 Hippocrates was living in an era, or even prior, prior, prior to Hippocrates, the era was associated with astrology, the astrological thinking of explaining, defining phenomena out there, where in order to understand the realities that existed, humans sought answers, literally the sun, the moon, and the stars. 
In fact, during that time, many of the adverse health conditions were referred to as, as influenza. Not the influence of viruses that we are familiar with today, but influenza in terms of the influences of the cell, cell bodies, as an example. So astrology served as the realm of understanding of, of, of health and disease. Now, while that may seem, seem, seem far-fetched, it's not so far-fetched even today. How many of you guys actually read your horoscopes and reflect on your own astrology, maybe just for interest, even to be guided by it, for example? And I actually have a copy of one of the local newspapers here. If I may just go to the at the page with the horoscopes, it says, it says, it says, and I'm a Sagittarius actually. So let me read what it says about Sagittarius. It says that the week, this week here, um, gets off to a pleasant start as friends and associates are likely to be in touch. Maybe part of this course, friends and associates are in touch. Enjoy the company of a special partner or love interest as the opportunities for romance are yours for the taking. Hmm, or maybe, maybe, maybe I'm a bit too late though because we're near the end of the week for that. Since chatty Mercury continues retrograde, try not to have many expectations. It's best to go with the flow if you can. With dynamic Mars entering a more private sector on your chart, you could find that your dreams are more vivid and perhaps worth something. Well, that's just an example of the interaction that existed in astrology, where planetary alignment, alignment, alignment and the interactions was used to describe phenomena on Earth. However, Hippocrates literally brought the con con concept of disease down to Earth and suggested that health is not necessarily as a result of the influences as associated and ascribed by astrology, but rather the airs, the, the, the waters and the places, the environment around us, Hippocrates proposed was implicated as the sources of good health as well as not so good health as the case may be. Hippocrates further alluded to the fact that depending on the influences of airs, waters, and some places, then that would have established imbalances, disrupted the homeostasis of the body. He further theorized that the body was made up of different compartments, and depending on the sub sub substances or the nature of a respective compartment, if there were excesses or imbalances or deficiencies, these manifested a disease. So somehow the idea of airs, waters, and place, 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 place provided a whole new understanding towards how the body reacts, responds to influences in the environment around us. And this is why I felt it important to sort of provide a reflection of Hippocrates airs of some places, but also to maybe share a modern day perspective. Where are we today? Have we changed our understanding of airs, waters, and places? Maybe it has changed in detail, but the context remains the same. Maybe at the end of the seminar, we can have a conversation on that. Hey, Satish, uh, I'm going to pause you for a quick second. Can you hear me? Sure, I can hear you, John. So we're getting some chop on your audio. Um, so can I actually have you leave the meeting and come back in? I'll stay on as the organizer. Yeah, sure. But sure. just leave the meeting. Close any applications that are up um, that uh, we don't need and, uh, and come back in, please. I will be right back, guys. Yes. Thank you. Seeing if we can improve the, uh, I was getting some chop on my end. Uh, 
Uh, while he's gone, I'll just remind everyone uh, of how we run these. Uh, when he comes back on, if you have any uh, questions, you want to come with a mic, you can use the hand icon to raise your hand and we'll uh, get to you when there's a break. Uh, or you can chat your questions and I will relay them to him um, when there's a break or at the end of the session. Is that for audio? Uh, it sounds better right now, so let's uh, let's share your screen. We'll make sure the recording's still running, and uh, I hope I didn't throw you off too much. No, much, no, much. no, that's fine. So if that is better, I think that that helps a lot. Yeah. Okay, thank to, you. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to go on team viewer. I'm working on some things while you're talking, but you keep going. Thanks, John. Okay, guys. So as an outline, we will be discussing Hippocrates' airs, waters, and places, but providing some type of current context to this discussion. Now, when we think about air, of course, we think about the sky, the air around us. But even historically, the air, as recognized by Hippocrates, was further defined to be specific towards adverse health conditions. In fact, the miasma or the miasmatic theory emerged as a direct description as to how the air, air, air impacted our health. The miasma, the period of time which allowed for that understanding of how air impacted our health led to the understanding or the description of malaria. Malaria, in terms of the term malaria, means bad air. Not necessarily because malaria is caused by bad air. We appreciate the, that malaria is caused by an organism, a plasmodium organism, which is spread by the Anopheline mosquito. But before time, before that understanding emerged, the miasma was used to describe diseases because bad air or bad smells, unsalubrious scents in an environment, encouraged and supported the development of diseases. And if you have bad smells, if you have bad air, for example, how do you, you counteract bad air? You counteract the bad air with good air. And good air would have served as a point of treatment, point of management. So how did we counteract miasma or bad air? Well, think about the practices which emerged from the miasma period. What about using, using, using incense for places of worship, for example? to dispel bad air in a given environment. But if you have a dead body in a coffin, for example, you will drip that dead body with flowers and put good sense into it. What about even persons and brides and people in, in marriages? As you begin your, 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 your new life, for example, you will assume a bouquet of flowers in your hand. Impart good air. So many practices that have sort of even survived the, the, the centuries would have emerged from an understanding of how it is impacted our health and our well-being also. Now, besides the, the miasma itself, we also have to recognize that many, many practices, medical practices emerge from that consideration of air impacted health. Think about the diagram with the, with the, with the physician. The physician actually, as part of personal, personal equipment, is wearing a beak-like structure. And that beak-like structure is to provide clean air for the physician as a physician attended to patients supposedly being adversely affected with bad air around them. So this idea of air is impacting health was historic. Hippocrates referred to it and the miasmatic theory really established air and the conditionalities of bad smells to be adverse impacting on health. But then what is it? As time progressed, we began to quantify air in terms of its composition. We can appreciate that air is primarily nitrogen in composition, followed by oxygen, as well as water vapor, carbon dioxide, some inert gases, maybe greenhouse gases are actually more 
more prominent now as part of this composition itself. But that was Hippocrates' period of time, where Hippocrates, when he described air, even the miasma, the composition of air, or even the components of air, would have been different to the air, air, air that we have today. What are some of the contributing pollutants, particles, fumes, gases that we introduce into our air today? today? So while historically we think that air can impact health, certainly that would have been the case, in a current context, how is air impacting our own health? Well, when we think about pollutants, we think about nitrogen oxides, we think about volatile organic compounds, we think about the sulfur oxides, we think about carbon monoxide, as an example, but also fine particles that are in the air, not to mention many pathogens that are, that are, that are also in the air. So air remains in, in, an influence to our health, maybe just in, in terms of new challenges and new exposures that affect our health and well-being. But besides the composition of air, besides the new components that are, that are not present in air, we, over time, have particularly compartmentalized our air in terms of indoor, 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 indoor air and outdoor air. Indoor air and indoor air is of significant importance because many of us actually live our lives in an indoor air environment. But we're also exposed on outdoor air perspective. So indoor air and outdoor air is impacting our health and well-being. Some of the challenges we're facing with today, whether it's respiratory distress, are associated with indoor air quality. And there are many systems in place to hopefully monitor and evaluate the quality of indoor air. But somehow indoor air is a reflection of outdoor air. So we have to bear cognizance of the fact that our air quality is significant to our own health and well-being, whether it's indoor and or outdoor. So from the, so from the, so from the purpose of air as its composition, whether it's Hippocrates days or currently, the air is an influence to our own health and well-being. Air. Well, in Hippocrates' era, one of the practices used in air was for communication, whether it was waving flags or even flying kites in some parts of the world, like in, in the east, 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 east part of Asia, China, for example. And the air was used to either claim territory or to communicate whether the entry of people coming in to one geographical location, or even signal it or communicating movement of information from one geographical location to the next, using kites, for example. In, in war times, a lot of uh, this type of demonstration was used to signal different types of even orders towards the, the military of the day. Today, we also use the air for communication using sound waves traveling via air. It's more modern, but we are still using, still, using, still using air for that purpose. So even our use of the air has certainly evolved, but the central theme and context of its use remains the same. I know Dr. Ellen Rapner is usually one of our, our strong supporters of this course as well. Dr. Rapner is from St. George's University and is a, is a journalist, talk radio host. And she is very much a, a prime user, user, user of air as it relates to how, how she operates and functions in her capacity as a journalist for both the United Nations and, and house in Washington, D.C. also. Travel. Of course, in Hippocrates' days, travel in air was non-existent. But travel today, today via air is commonplace. And that has, has, has influences to our lifestyles, to our experiences, and also our health. When we think about a volume of people that is traveling, roughly about 
900 plus million people travel in any given year. That people, that's almost one in seven or eight persons that are engaged in air travel. And that will only incre incre increase over time. There are many different routes, there are many different, different geographical locations that are attained through air travel. And that is a good thing as the world becomes more interconnected via the one world concept, concept example. Think about all of us in this, in this course, as we share in this experience, we are from different parts of the world. And many of us are engaged, engaged, engaged in travel for work, for, for leisure. So travel is part of our lifestyle. However, with that air travel comes health challenges. What about diseases that are transported across the world via air travel? Whether it's the movements of people or animals or even the products of animals, for example. Think about infectious disease outbreaks. An outbreak in one part of the world in decades gone by was isolated to that part of the world. In fact, many of us we may not have even received information of, of an outbreak occurring in one part of the world. The reality, however, as a result of air travel, for example, is any outbreak of any disease in any part of the world is of global importance because that disease, persons can serve as carriers of disease, people can travel and become exposed to diseases in a very, very short time. So we have had examples. We had examples of, 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 of influenza that was able to translocate from Asia to Europe to North America. We've had, had this acquired respiratory syndrome moving across continents in very short space of time, sometimes within 24 hours. We have had the influenza type AH1N1 pandemic of 2009, or known as swine flu, which affected more than 100, 100, 100, 100 countries because of travel and movement. So when we think about the air as an influence to health today, there are many different factors by which the air can adversely compromise the health and well-being of the planet at large. And, and this is why it warrants a discussion, a consideration for airs as an influence to health, referring to Hippocrates reportings, but also applying it to our current understanding. Then we have the weather. Weather as it relates to conditions, events in the air. Now we can all appreciate, regardless of wherever in the world that we belong to, whether it's in the Caribbean region, whether it's in the Pacific region or North America, Europe, regardless, regardless, regardless of wherever you are, you are affected by adverse weather events. Not just affected by these adverse weather events, but you are increasingly more vulnerable to these events by virtue of increase in frequency, the intensity, the duration of many of these events itself. And as population sensations increase, more persons are succumbing to challenges of these weather events. And that has to do with conditions in the air as part of that disaster prone experience that all regions of the world face. Now, one example of adverse weather events in terms of an influence towards it is well described in terms of global warming. The surface is warming up. The temperature of our oceans is increasing. But bear in mind, while the surface temperature increases, while the ocean temperature increases, What's happening in the air is adverse, actually. You'll see, for example, when we think about global warming, surface temperature is increasing consistently. 
with each year. But what is happening with temperature in the air? Consistently, there is a decrease in temperature. The air, the air, the air, the air. So it's getting cold in the air. Maybe from my high, high school experiences, I can draw reference to the fact that matter cannot be created nor destroyed, but can be transformed from one to the other. So maybe it's a matter of if the surface is getting warmer, well, then that energy or that matter has to be taken from some, from some, from some, from some, so the air is getting colder. But if you have increasing extremes of temperatures on the surface of land, on the, on the water, and the air, these extremes in temperatures are going to give rise to more conditions, more events, more wind, more cold, more systems, which is encouraging the weather events that we're facing across the planet. So, 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 so the idea of the air as an influence to our health, our well-being, through disasters, through adverse weather conditions, through flooding, through wind currents, through changes in coastal communities, there is an interaction with the air and the surface. So when we think about environmental changes, let us also bear cognizance of the fact that it is getting, it is getting, it is getting cooler up there. But think about this as well. Next time you travel, for, for example, and you're in the aircraft, and as part of the visual display units, you can observe your changes in altitude, and you can also appreciate the temperature associated with that altitude. Have a look at how your temperature is changing with changes in altitude. Now, naturally, it should get cold, cold, cold. But I'm suggesting that the rate of change of temper temper temperature is actually increasing with time. To provide context to that, for many of you who travel, let's say you are familiar with a particular route of travel. You may have 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, been using that route and observing that the ceiling or the cruising altitude for your aircraft would have been between 20,000 feet and 35,000 feet. That's the average range of your cruising altitude. Today, if aircrafts are to avoid significant turbulence and adverse weather, they need to be anywhere between 37,000 feet and sometimes, sometimes, sometimes beyond 40,000 feet. Because uh, the air currency, the air surface is actually becoming more extreme and more violent. So, so, so air travel needs to increase its altitude to avoid these adverse events. But as you increase your altitude, you have to build, build, build aircrafts, of course, which they are, to withstand the conditions of increased altitude. But when you increase your altitude, you're also increasing, increasing, increasing the, the challenges to the fuselage or to the airframe of an aircraft. For example, you're increasing your likelihood to experience conditions. And if your conditions increase um, towards a likelihood of a freezing, that's going to affect your instruments. It's going to affect your, your, your wings and your aerofoil shape, for example, which can come, come from a flight. So the point is that the, 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 the air has many different contributions to all, to, all, to all realities today in terms of how we are affected, whether it's just the infectious diseases that are airborne, whether it's through the exposures to novel and different types of pollutants that are out there, whether it's through the fact that the air is just different, temperature is different, our experiences with, with weather is different, 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 different as well. And this is our current context as opposed to the miasma or the unsalubrious sense of air as initially associated with the Hippocrates model. So air remains an influence to our health, maybe just in some different contexts, as the case may be. Let's move on to waters now. Hippocrates alluded to the fact that water, water, water can impact your health. From persons consuming water, 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 being exposed to water, and succumbing to adverse health effects. 
some of the significant challenges that we are faced with today is in fact issues of our source of water. Is our water safe to consume or to utilize? And what about the security, the supply, the sustainable use of our water resources? These are fundamental questions that face each and every one of us. Regardless of where you are located, your water lifestyle and practice has changed. Ask your grandparents if they are alive or your parents, for example, even if you're from your earlier childhood experiences. And think about how you consumed water. Maybe it was from outdoor sources, 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 sources or even pipe board water. Today, the reality for many of us is that we need to assure safe water through treated water available by bottle. That experience and evolution or source of water speaks volumes to the fact that the water in the environment has, has changed significantly. Our resources, our global resources of water, a lot of it is in oceans and seas, the majority in fact. We also have waters in rivers and in lakes. We also have water that's frozen and we have water that's underground. But even these sources are actually becoming challenged as well. They're becoming challenged in the access to the water. But even if we can access the water, the, the, the quality of the water, is that water in fact portable, safe for consumption? And there are many different experiences we can think about. We can think about, for example, that some rivers are not reaching the, the coastlines, for example, the Colorado the Col the Col the Col the Col River in, in, in the US, for example is stopping short of the state of California. And, to, and today, the state of California is in a, a water stress situation. In fact, they have a drought problem and there are fires associated with, with that drought. Think about the, the parts of Eastern Europe, Northern Asia, 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 in the area of the former Soviet Union. There was a sea called the RLC in the 1980s. You can have a search. Look for the RLC. Now, I'm not speaking about the RL Gulf or the RL Lake. I'm speaking about the RLC. A lot of water. But today, in maps, that sea does exist because the water from that sea was diverted out for different purposes, agriculture, etc. But when you when you dry up a sea, 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 essentially, what are you doing? You are compromising our culture, you're compromising transport through sea ports, for example, you're compromising economic activity, source of food, and that will disrupt a geographical location. There will be geopolitical conflicts, which is the case today. Think about the River Nile, which travels across many countries and essentially passes through, through, through Egypt. And for many of these countries, those that are upstream are beginning to assume conflict postures because the water they are receiving, well, it's polluted one and the volume is very minimal. Everywhere in this world, 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 world we have challenges with our sources of water. This will impact our feasibility and our sustainability for development, for meeting the demands of a changing and an expanding human population. So when we think about the sources of water, we have to think about the fact that these sources are not necessarily just, just, just available, but they're changing. They may have been available, but now the composition and the volume of water is changing. Now, for the most part, the world have had its natural sources of water, albeit there are some regions like desert regions, for example, where that that's, that's source of water will be very limited to underground water, if that's the case. Think about your own environments. Think about your, your, your source of water. How has your source of water changed? 
Maybe with changes in weather patterns, your source of water is changing. Maybe in terms of consumption patterns, maybe in terms of pollution habits, the quality of your water, your water, your water, your water is changing. So Hippocrates was correct centuries ago when he alluded to the fact that water impacts our lives. It's essential. We can establish that. But even the act of being exposed to water can be healthy or can lead to unhealthy consequences. This map shows the world and it shows essentially the areas of the world where, where, where populations are without reasonable access to safe, safe water. It stands to reason if your water supply is unsafe, you are prone, predisposed to waterborne diseases. And when you superimpose this map with waterborne disease events that are occurring, the waterborne disease events are more populated in the areas that are with a reasonable supply of safe water. It superimposes. It makes a lot of sense. So water, its source, its quality, its, its availability, its accessibility impacts the born diseases. And every part of the world has challenges with waterborne diseases. Couple the waterborne diseases even with the air and travel movements of people. Haiti, for example, in the Caribbean are fighting an outbreak of cholera because of the introduction of cholera into that country. And that country already has a very compromised system of water distribution, sewage management, environmental management, broadly speaking. In many parts of the world, this issue of water source, but also water, water quality, is creating a lot of health and disease burdens, which justifies the fact that water adversely impacts health and well-being. Now, in the future, in your future, we will continue to face challenges with what's the, what's the, what's the supply. Think about your children and their children to, 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 to come. How sustainable is our current practices and quality of water towards promoting health and well-being. This chart shows the difference between 1995 and 2025. That's a mere 30 years. I'll say part of someone's life expectancy. In 30 years, we have seen a change in this map in terms of the percentage of total water that is available. There are some regions of the world in which the water has changed from 10% to more than 40% in terms of supply, resources. So we're all challenged with, with, with an increasing population and increased demand for the use of water, but a depleting water source. So the, the impact of water on our health is direct through waterborne diseases, but it's also broader than that. It will inform and instruct how we develop. Challenges we're faced with, how we engage our environment, how the landscape will differ, whether from the droughts or fires, for example, as a result of a lack of water, our agriculture, our food production, which depends on water, will also be informed by water sources. So water is an influence to our health, whether it's historical or current uh, the reality. Finally, Hippocrates referred to places as waters and no places. Places in terms of your geographical location around you, how that impacted your health. During the period of, of, of Hippocrates was also Vitruvius polio. Polio 
advocated for the use of sentinel animals towards informing if an environment was healthy for human habituation. What Vitruvius Polio did was, was in the era of conquest, where empires were seeking to, to expand their borders of, of their territories. If you identify new geographical location, you want to establish some type of habituation there to ensure that you claim that land. But before you exert persons to an unknown environment, Paul, you would have placed animals in that environment. If the animals, let's say, died or was unable to grow or reproduce, that environment was considered not suitable, suitable, suitable for human habituation. So this idea of places influencing our health was historical. But in that context, the places that persons were exposed to were to some, some, some extent limited. Although there was a lot of movements of soldiers, military persons with trade or products, 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 products goods, services, etc. But a lot of the places persons were exposed to were fairly defined. Today, however, the places that we are familiar with are quite broad in terms of different environments, different climates, climates, climates. But it's also these very places are changing right before our very eyes. The landscape keeps changing. All of us can relate to hearing stories from our parents or grandparents. Wherever we visited a location, they will refer to the fact that back in their days, this place was different. Everything was different. It stands to reason. So, so, there's a lot of new initiatives, development. There's a lot of new civilizations and technology, movements of people. So sure, granted, the environment changes. Change is, is, is constant, sure. But that change should inform healthy outcome as opposed to an adverse outcome. So the places that we are referring to, for example, think, think, think of the Amazon in Brazil. Now, there are many adverse outcomes of the Amazon undergoing deforestation. Here we have in a matter of months, you can change a forest into essentially a dry savanna. And this is occurring at a rate, 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 rate of about 60 football fields. Depending on where you are, maybe cricket fields per minute. So by the end of this seminar, in the time that we would have discussed this topic of airs, waters, and places, hundreds and thousands of hectares of land would have been deforested. Now that has many consequences. It has consequences in terms of, the, in, terms of the, in terms of the overall health of the planet. It has consequences to composition of air, oxygen, carbon dioxide dynamic. It has consequences to the ecology, to wildlife. It has consequences to maybe the spillover of diseases from those wild, wild animals to humans. It has consequences to land degradation, soil erosion, and how does that allow how, how, for the use of that land? So the fact, the fact that places are changing may not necessarily be for our benefit, and we have to bear in mind. Think about Bangkok in Thailand. And I know that Dr. Sri Lakpi Chainarok is actually on board with us today. And here is a picture of Bangkok. In a matter of 15 years, this landscape has changed. So the places that we are part of is changing in front of our very eyes. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for the fact that there's water in the canals of Bangkok? That water may not necessarily be fit for human use because of more and more pollution and waste entering. The more people leads to more waste. 
more waste just enters in, in, into the environment. But maybe the water is also being used for different purposes, whether it's in in engineering plants or used in agriculture or industry, for example. How sustainable is this over time? Over time, over time. So the question of places and its impact on health is true. Whether it's Vitruvius polio suggesting thing that this environment may or may not be healthy for human use, depending on the health of animals. Or today, as we engage different places, but also change these places, is that impacting our health? Many of us visit different parts of the world, the world, the world. And as you visit different parts of the world, maybe you're exposed to different diseases. For those who travel, for example, to certain parts of sub-Saharan Africa, Africa, you may have to manage your health with prophylactic treatment for malaria because the place that you are visiting is endemic for a particular disease. As you take measures, we vaccinate today. And vaccination has been very, been very, been very, very, very successful in terms of mitigating several trans transportation and travel-related diseases. But even our food is changing as a result of places. As we move places, we're moving not just ourselves, but we're moving the source of our food. We're moving the different types of lifestyles that we are experiencing. And it's becoming very much global. In that, the experience in one part of the world is easy, easy, easily replicated somewhere else in the world. Think about the foods we consume. Regardless of whichever country you travel to, you can have the same source of food. Foods of different traditional cultural backgrounds are now becoming universal. Our diets are now quite shared. And if our diets are shared, 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 lifestyle are shared, then we share disease burdens. Whether it's obesity, whether it's metabolic disorders like diabetes, whether it's storage diseases, heart disease with risk status that are consistent across lifestyles and exposures. So the places are changing, yes, but also the experiences are becoming more uniform. Which warrants for an understanding, understanding, understanding of a global health context as it relates to how we understand health from a geographical perspective, but also from a global perspective. Because today, wherever you belong, whichever profession you're part of, you must be global in competence, in relevance. You must be able to be mobile, to participate, function and, function, and, function, and function, contribute in different parts of the world, which is a good thing, as we are indeed global citizens and not just citizens from one particular geographical location anymore. But as we change our places, as we experience new cultures and traditions, which is very enriching, we must do that with a consideration towards sustainability in that for those that are yet to come, will they be able to enjoy the life expectancy, the quality of life, the technology, the opportunities that we have had. And that's a fundamental question we need to ask. Can this change be sustained across gener generations? Something, something there, I guess. Not just places are changing, but who is involved in these places? Us, for example. The demographics of places are changing. Uh, this global air traffic suggests just, 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 just that the world is very connected. And regardless of which society you belong to, you will be observing an increasing diversity of people, of practices, of cultures, of traditions, which is engaging and enriching for each and every one of us. And as demographic, demographic, demographic change, we need to realize 
that we have to be able to be competent to work with diverse, diverse graphic. Let me provide an example. If you are a physician in New York City, for example, you do not decide who is your patient. Anyone from any part of the world, being human, enables you to be a patient, to be susceptible to diseases. And as societies become more diverse, people from different backgrounds can present themselves as patients. As a physician in a hospital in New York, you have to be able to understand people of different backgrounds, maybe different exposures, different experiences, and be able to provide medical care and attention for that individual. If, for example, an individual comes from some countries in South America, Southern Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, as an example, and then they present to you with congestive heart failure, you need to understand that one of the main causes of congestive heart failure in some South American countries is a disease called Chagas disease. And Chagas disease is caused, is caused, is caused by a protozoan, Panosoma cruzii, which is spread by a vector, reduvid of the kissing bug. And by understanding that diverse reality of different places and different influences on health, you can become more competent, competent, competent and efficient in providing the appropriate care and management. So this demographic change that we are seeing and how that impact, impact, impacts our health is real today and to become even more real as the world becomes more and more diverse. And we have to embrace the, the niche and the opportunity to work with diverse people as, 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 as to attend to the different needs at the same time. So in one context, the world is becoming more uniform. The shared lifestyles and diets and experiences, but that is only the as a result of diversification. And that diversification is creating different experiences at the same time. So it is tricky. It is tricky for us. Whether it's the disease landscape that we have to manage, whether it is the lifestyles that we tend to assume and adopt depending on the environment that we belong to, it's all linked to the places that are changing. Hippocrates in his time may have, may have alluded to places in terms of the environmental influences that would have served to change, change, change homeostasis status in the body. That is still the case because there are many influences that are changing the different dynamics that exist in our body today. But that is essentially the reality in the world in which we live in today. Places are changing, people are changing. And that increases this is this is this is the opportunity but provides a challenge for us to manage these differences that exist. So in conclusion, because I would like to sort of have a conversation with you on these topics and any topic that you think is relevant. But let's just examine this whole context of airs, waters, and places once more. With reference to Hippocrates, airs, waters, and places, being an influence to health. The question is, in the modern world in which we live in today, does air, water, and place, are those risk factors, influences for our health and well-being? Of course, we can argue both ways. They can be of benefit, benefit, benefit to us, and they can also be deleterious at the same time. And as we conclude this seminar, but also conclude the entire course throughout 2017, I would like to draw your reference to a couple of maps and pay specific attention to these maps. And I would like you to sort of superimpose 
one map with the other, other with the other. You get my point. And let's see if we can sort of interpret and reflect on a particular theme, which, which is constant across these maps. This is a map of uh, the gross domestic product. There's density distribution, distribution, distribution across the planet. We see the darker colors of red serving as areas of high gross domestic product. And the lighter colors are areas of lower gross domestic product. Bear that in mind. Understand the distribution. There seems to be some type of, of darkening effect, obviously north of the equator, 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 but in North America, Western Europe, and increasingly more in many parts of Asia. So with this increase and change in gross domestic product, what about the environmental burden of diseases? Well, the lighter colors seem to be the ones with the lower environmental burdens. North America, Western Europe, 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 Australia, very much so. So one may draw a point of reference that via your gross domestic product is the lower your susceptibility to environmental burdens of diseases. That's one point. What about chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases? Well, this is a, is a tricky one because chronic diseases are, diseases, are, diseases are not necessarily isolated to any particular income group of countries, whether it's developed countries with high gross domestic product or lower income countries, chronic diseases is becoming a universal problem, which emphasizes the universality of our health and disease landscape and also the need for a one world, world, world approach. This map, map, map highlight, highlights emerging infectious disease outbreaks. This map suggests that North America and Western Europe, which have the highest gross domestic products, are the areas where they serve as, as points of reference for emerging infectious diseases. I have a few comments on that. Maybe that they have more diagnostic capabilities. So these diseases are also occurring elsewhere, but because of their higher gross domestic product, they have more resources and structure and capabilities to diagnose and identify them. But also, these diseases are emerging in those locations, being sourced from somewhere else. Because of the movements, the shift of people, of products, of diseases. This map essentially shows foodborne diseases. And this map sort of highlights some particular areas, but the particular, particular, particular areas that are highlighted will be the red and dark colors, for example. Um, those are areas of obvious population density and water, water safety and security issues. But as water resources become more restricted and compromised, this foodborne and waterborne disease distribution will become more of a common coloration across different regions if nothing is done to attend to the issue of sustainable supply of water in time to come. What about vector-borne diseases? Traditionally, vector-borne diseases were isolated to some countries in the world, even some latitude and longitude. But vectors themselves are expanding in their scope, 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 in their ranges. Mosquitoes, as an example. As temperature of places change, mosquitoes are finding themselves more and more able to survive and, of course, share diseases. Think about some types of phenomena we are experiencing today. We are experiencing airport port malaria, which essentially is airports that receive international flights from malaria endemic 
region, 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 region of the world, there are cases of malaria in a particular radius around that international airport because the people are traveling with the plasmodium organism circulating and the mosquitoes are entering and surviving in that given environment. And if you have the, the mosquitoes, if you have carriers, if you have the environment supporting the mosquitoes, and of course, susceptible people, those are the ingredients you need for manifesting the disease, 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 disease. And that will increasingly be a problem because the whole idea of the environment changing, that change becoming more amenable to vectors, will certainly serve to create greater burdens of vector vector disease in time to come. This is another indicator of population health. Infant as infant mortality rates are equated to the health of the population, but also to the status and the functionality of a health system. And in this map, you will appreciate that the areas of the world that have the highest gross domestic product, they are the ones that have some of the lower infant mortality rates. It may not be the case for everywhere. There are some countries in the world considered mid-level income, and they are achieving very low infant mortality rates, especially through community-based efforts. There are some countries in the world that are spending significant money and still being adversely affected by high levels of infant mortality rates. And that's a conditionality of their health system, but it's also the fact that income level does not necessarily select or protect from diseases anymore. As diseases move and shift across the world through economic zones, through different environments. And as we conclude, let's look at life expectancy. Let's understand that life expectancy is varied. It's varied in different regions of the world, but you know what? It is also varied even within a very short geographic range. Let's say that you are in a metropolis. You can take one of those roads or even a, a train route. And as you move from one region of a city to the next, as you observe different levels of income and socioeconomic realities, life expectancies will change. So even with with the nation, life expectancy changes, and globally speaking, different regions of the world, the world, the world, the world also share different life expectancy. And in today's world, the World Health Organization has three main priority areas: antimicrobial resistance, climate change, and refugee health. And people are moving around as refugees, and even for migration purposes towards seeking employment, education opportunities. And that need for, need for, need for acculturation into new societies can either predispose individuals to adverse health outcomes, which can impact their life expectancy within a particular geographical location or span across the entire planet. And in this map, we see the countries with the highest levels of gross domestic product. They are the ones with the highest life expectancies. And those that are lower have lower life expectancies. But I would like to dissect this a bit further in the sense that even within countries with high gross domestic product, as well as high life expectancy, there are disparities that exist. Not everyone is experiencing those high life expectancies. In fact, there are sections of population, those that are minority groups sometimes, those that are, that, are, that are maybe immigrant populations, they are the ones that are experiencing lower life expectancies. So there is an issue of disproportionate outcomes based on life expectancy as an indicator 
for health and well-being, well-being, well-being within a country or across the planet. So, so hopefully, when we think about the airs, the waters, and the places, and we look at different measures of health and well-being, we can see that regardless of where we are, issues of the air, whether it's the climate, whether the pollution, whether it's the whole aspect of movement and travel of people, issues of water, water sources, water safety, water security issues, places, by virtue of changing landscape within a short space of time, and the demographic shifts that are also occurring. Our health is inextricably linked to all of these components of airs, waters, and places. So, in Homet, 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 to so Hippocrates, airs, waters, and places, within the, the more context, today's reality, airs, waters, and places play as much significance, if not more, today than it even was in the era and time of Hippocrates. And when we think about this whole experience that we have, think about the airs, waters, and places. What are we really speaking about? We're well, we speaking about our planet. The air that we refer to is the air for our planet. From air circulation to currents, to movements and shifts, we share in this air experience. And the waters, pollution, may be sourced from one part of the world, it may affect another part of the world to shift some movements of water currents. Places, places are now becoming easily accessible to travel and movements. Therefore, the approach to understand health from the individual level, to the family, to the community, to indeed, the population, 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 I beseech, I beg your indulgence towards a one world, one health, one medicine approach. And at St. George's University, University, we share in this idea of one health, one medicine within a one world context. context, context. Our faculty, our student body, comes from more than 140 countries around the world. The work that we do through our alumni, through our research, through our projects, are indeed global. Our academic programs includes programs of medicine, veterinary medicine, arts and sciences, public health, business administration, environmental sciences, social sciences, and the communities we serve is a diverse community. Our graduates out there are practicing working in different places with different people. And at St. George's University in our education, in our research and practice, One Health of Medicine is central to us. We write about it, we speak about it, and, so, and, so, and sometimes we even sing about it as well. And here is where I would like to honor this course, hopefully at least, and the time that you have shared with us today as part of this seminar by sharing, sharing, sharing with you a brief discourse via song on One Health, One Medicine. And it goes something like this. Hope you guys are ready and feel free to join me. Diseases are emerging from the world over, 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 over each year. Different faces, place, 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 it's like if it don't care. This is a problem for both you and me. To learn and care for all is what I see. Mm -hmm. 
any careers who work to the point of going mental at the end of the day overcome it we shall as help for one is truly help for row 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 one half must be our new new normal people of the planet creatures of this earth check out sju for una momentito one health, one medicine. Yo, from the classrooms to the hostels, we all go. And acne to zoology, if this is we know, it will love our friends of our amigos. One health, one medicine. Yo, let's celebrate for the years of SG. You, 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 a center of excellence that we all know. We met the public health, public health, public health is what we saw. Which knows is if you feel like you are going loca, sing the melodies of a sweet soca. I say one health, you're my favorito. Combining human, animals, and environmental health, yo. These are solutions like you never know. From the air, sun, sun, sea, and even the snow. Whichever a medicine, a bioculture, beetle, 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 public health, or global, often science is covered up. What about vector borne diseases? Not to mention all those disasters. Disease can cross species from anywhere, people and animals and need proper health care. We can't just uh, sit back and start to sway. We need to get together and church, church, church. We are away. He said, Mucho grande, a que lo otra es pequeño, del aire de la comida o del 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 veto. One health, one medicine. Yo, from the classrooms and the hostels, we all go. Anatomy to zoology, this is what we know. It will do our friends, our amigos. Which you knows is if you feel like you are going loca. Sing the melodies of a sweet soca and say, One health, you my favorito. Let's celebrate 40 years of you yo, a center of excellence that we all know. When men that public health is we so combining human animals and environmental health, yo, these are solutions like, like you never know. From the air, so I sun, sea, and even the snow. At the end of the seminar, for a day. Hope you see that me, that me, that me, that thing is a problem. For my crops to weather, we have solutions when we could come together. One health, one medicine. Ese mucho grande, cualquier otra. Ese pequeño de la infecciosa crónica. Funcionará para todo. One health, one medicine, yo. That's it for our seminar today. I hope you enjoyed the, the discussion. Also, hopefully you enjoyed the song as well. But I would certainly like to open up the audio so that we can have a conversation on this issue of one world, one health, one medicine. What it means to you. How should we go forward as we end 2017 and contemplate on beginning 2018 with a, with, a, with a renewed and invigorated approach towards wow. the health of ourselves and, of course, our planet. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you Dr. Badezi. Thank you for the, for the presentation, <laughs> and thank you especially for that song. <laughs> thank you very much, Daisy. All right, so feel free, guys. Yeah. For sure. So uh, as we get into the discussion, let me just remind folks of, of how it works. Um, if you have a question, you want to come on the microphone. Um, it's a good chance to today because it's Dr. Badezi, and um, you know, been running this thing for the last twelve months. Uh, then you can raise your hand, and we'll try to bring you on there. And if you want to just type your question out, you can type it out in the chat, which is at the bottom of your go to training panel, and uh, I'll forward it to him um, to respond to. So, with that, uh, let's get started with Tremaine, who's had their hand up for a little while. Tremaine, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, and uh, when you're ready, you can come on the mic and, uh, and ask your question. Hi, good afternoon, Dr. Busy. Hi, Tremaine. Hi, thank you for the presentation and the song. <laughs> you're welcome. I just have one question. What, how would literacy relate to One Health, One Medicine, both in the educated and the uneducated or across the board in terms of would it play a role in developing countries that are, you know, as we've seen in the maps, not as fortunate or have low GDP? And how would it affect those who are highly educated as well? Sure. Okay. So that's a very good question, Shamin. And um, let me first reflect on, on what I 
was made to understand and also accept as a conditionality of health and well-being. An individual's health, or collectively as a community, a society, has a lot to do with behavior. But behavior, behavior is the end point, the result of how we perceive things, our attitude towards things. But our perception and attitude is based on our knowledge. So, so some knowledge informs our attitude perceptions, which ultimately instructs our behavior. If there is a challenge on literacy, well, then that will compromise knowledge, which certainly can compromise your attitude perceptions and behavior. And it's the behavior point which can certainly determine exposures, support and encourage risk factors, or even be protective towards health and advance your health. So in so in so in so behavior, we need the literacy and the, and the, and the knowledge to go hand in hand with one another. But you also also make point to me that even those that are professionals, for example, even from the context of One Health, that we have some difficulty even in, in understanding our, our, our service and our, our problems towards deriving solutions. And I also believe that is a literacy issue. Because many times we are very, very much paralyzed or confined to our own professional community or the scope in which we are able to function. However, if we were to mitigate our own limitations by joining a collaborative effort where we have different persons of different skills, bring different competencies towards a solution for a problem, then that can encourage a more productive and a more successful and meaningful outcome. So we must be able to understand our limitations and professions must be able to partner with other. And this is the approach and the concept of One Health, One Medicine. One Health, One Medicine by itself is not a career per se or, or, or a specific discipline. What it attempts to, to serve as is a medium or mechanism whereby problems in reality, they're complicated. Whether it's a disease that has influence influ 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 of society, of culture, of the environment, of microorganisms, of, of the climate, for example. So you need different people to get to get to get together to solve this problem. And that requires a level of partnership, but also literacy, literacy in understanding collectively the challenges and the opportunities that various disciplines can actually bring forward to a particular solution. So I see both as an issue from a professional context, as well as from the issue of individual and community collective behaviors, whether you're in a developed country or a developing country context. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that quick question. Thanks, Dr. Badezi. Um, as we queue up some others, um, I'll just ask kind of a general question about the, you know, the, the 12 months that, that we've gone through. Um, is there anything that you have learned uh, over the course of the past, you know, 12 seminars we've had that maybe you did not expect to learn or had not seen before or were surprised by over the course of 2017? Yeah, thank, thank you, John. I have had to actually go through that, that self-reflection of this experience as well. And in fact, our seminar in November last month was entitled Zoonoses, the Blind Spot of One Health. Health, health. And, and that seminar was biased in a, in a, in a sense, not, in, not into the topic only, but because of my own experiences. I have always understood health within my training experience, which is limited, of course, and focused on the interactions with humans, animals, and, 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 and pathogens. And I have been very limited in terms, in, terms, in terms of recognizing and also being able to utilize the avenues of how society, cultural perspectives, can participate 
and even inform that human-animal pathogenic type of interaction. So for me, it has been a learning experience towards recognizing that this idea of one health, one medicine is not, is not, is not, is not just human medicine, animal medicine, and environmental medicine only. One must also recognize the fact that humans, they're social creatures. And a lot of our experiences is based on our traditions or practices or value systems, which can sometimes select for vulnerabilities at the same time. So that is what I have increasingly become more cognizant of as it relates to expanding bending the scope of one health, one medicine, to beyond the human, animal, and environmental dynamic itself. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so while we uh, see if there are other folks that want to um, either raise their hand or type in the chat, maybe this is a good chance for me to kind of introduce the final exam and what that's going to be. Um, so I think Satish, um, you know, Dr. Badezi and I will target before Christmas to have an exam up. Um, we'll alert everyone who's enrolled in the course when that exam will be offered. Um, and for folks who want to take the exam and pay a, uh, the fee for credit, there is a fee for credit. Obviously, the course is free, but if, uh, if you receive uh, continuing education credit, there's a fee for it. Um, we'll post the day, and the exam will be, what do you think, Satish, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40, 50 questions? Yeah. And, and the idea is that this course is to enable a, a learning community from across the, the world on different topics of one, 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 one health, one medicine. But part of the offering of this course is also, 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 also to provide continuing professional credits. And we have part partnered with the United States National Board of Public Health Examiners, and they will offer 12 continuing continue education credits as part of your participation. To objectively qualify for those credits, there is a comprehensive exam. And that, and that, and that exam will be based on experiences in the course, the recordings, things, things, participation involvement. So for those of you who are interested in these credits, if, if for example, you can write to us and, and register for the, for the exam, but make sure and review the recordings from each month, go through the different themes, and it's not going to be a detailed exam. It's, 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 it's going to be an exam to essentially gain your perspectives and your thoughts on this whole context of one world, 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 one health and one medicine. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Um, there is a uh, there is a chat in the box. Let me just wrap up one more thing with uh, exam before we get to it, and that is that um, uh, the exam is, or sorry, uh, the credits are worth twelve uh, professional development credits, and the exam fee is one hundred U.S. dollars. Um, but regardless, all of the presentations that have occurred this term uh, or for this course are available on the website. So if you missed any or want to go back to any. They're all going to be available, uh, and they'll be available for uh, for a while. So anytime you want to go check those out, you're able to. Uh, and let's move on to Jesse Ann's question. Uh, I'll read it. Uh, it says, hello, Dr. Daisy. I'm glad I didn't miss your live presentation. I believe that going forward, the OHOM concept should be introduced in secondary schools so that from a young age, children are aware of the impact of that concept on their daily lives. In the Caribbean region, the ministries of health and education could collaborate to put emphasis on the need for better handling of the many diseases or illnesses that affect the region in recent times. Yep, I, I, I can support that statement, um, but also to, to allow for that, that, that cross-cutting education experience, we also need to recognize that the education system is mounted on a, on a, on a curriculum, and the curriculum is still to some extent or to, to a significant extent, compartmentalized, as it should be in terms of different subject and focal areas. The point, however, though, is that as we teach different topics and subject areas and, and concentrations, at the earliest age, 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 whether high school level or even earlier, we all, regardless where we are in this world, we must be able to integrate information and apply the information towards real life experiences. 
And that is what knowledge should do. Knowledge without having an impact in, in the world in which we live in is, is irrelevant, almost. So whatever knowledge that the curriculum must be able to be applied, whether it's case studies, problem-based learning, where these students get together and they recognize problems and through critical thinking, integrate knowledge towards effective solutions. And that's how I think we can inculcate this idea of an integrated education experience, which One Health provides, but even outside of the health realm, whether it's in, in business, economics, whether it's in language, la 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 whether it's in, in, in social sciences, the, the, the idea of an in integrated knowledge base is certainly more powerful for the, for the students, but also more progressive for when those individuals go out in society and they are required to be critical thinkers and problem solvers. Because that is what the world need. need. Great. Um, so that's, I think that wraps up what we have in the chat. And with the hands raised, it does. So I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Badezi, to give any closing thoughts. Sure. Well, thank you very much um, for participating to this seminar. And this seminar is part of a seminar series, One World, One Health, One Medicine, offered by Georgia's University. I would like to thank many people who have been able to to allow for the, for, the, for the realization of this course. And John, John, who you guys hear from, he has been part and parcel of this course. He is the designer of this course, the developer of this course. And we appreciate the efforts and work that John has put in, and John and his team. So we have an online team. And as we continue in 2018, keep looking out for other online opportunities at St. George's University. We have a wonderful online development team, John Modica, our, our, our program director, John Soap, Donna Walker, Kimon, who has just recently joined us. And we plan on providing greater access and availability to the education opportunities at St. George's University to anyone in an online setting. Thing, thing. Also, with that in mind, in January of 2018, which is just a couple of days from now, we will be will be will be beginning our master's of public health program with the option to pursue and complete that entire program online so for those of you who are interested in budget public health education especially focus in human health as it relates to the environment and all aspects of it from a global context consider the master master program which is online and accessible to you beginning in January of 2018. And you can actually apply for that program even from now. So as we finalize this session, we are in the month of December. And as we approach the end, the end, the end of 2017, we can't help individually or, we, or, we, or we collectively to think about the fact that we have a year that just went by. Trust that as you review, as you reflect on the year gone by, that you have a smile on your face. And I would like to encourage you with the new year approaching. Prioritize your health, your well being. Because it is your health and your well being individually, individually, individually. If each and every one of us can do that, it will lead to a healthier community, healthier populations. But it is linked as hopefully this seminar alluded to, to that of society and the environment around us. To promote our health, we have to understand that the airs, waters, and the places concept, as ascribed by, by, by Hippocrates, is also our reality. We wish you, on behalf of St. George's University, nothing but the very best for 2018, and stay tuned as we look forward to sharing with each and every one of you more opportunities to engage in a global conversation as it relates to One World, One Health, and One Medicine. Thank you for now, and until another time, very best wishes for the holiday season 
and for the new year to come. Goodbye for now. Thank you, Dr. Bedezi, and thank you to everyone who's joined uh, in this session, the live sessions, and and watch the recordings. Recording, recording. Thank you. Bye bye.